you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I empathize with you being here on a Saturday morning, so thank you for your, um, thanks for your presence, both mentally and physically. So, um, real quick, um, so how many of you are familiar with Title IX? Okay, all right, good. So I'm not preaching to the choir too much. Okay, so Title IX, uh, the, the university is committed to the safety and equity uh, for, um, for gender across the gender spectrum. And so it's so important that recently the university created a position full time for Title IX. Um, all universities um, or all education centers have to have a Title IX coordinator. Um, and I'll go through the federal law. So this is a federally mandated training, and so part of what my job is is to make sure that staff, faculty, students, undergrad, grad, all know about Title IX and what, and what that includes. Um, just real quick, a little bit about myself is I was um, social work faculty for, this is my 13th year, um, so this is the first year I'm not teaching, which just seems really weird. Um, well, I'm not in the classroom. Um, let me put this here. Uh, so I was faculty um, in social work for um, about 12 years. I was the field director, so I empathize with having to, you know, with working out in, um, at placements and having practicums, and so I kind of feel like we're cousins, you know, professionally. Um, I, I placed students. I was a liaison with the supervisors with the LCSWs, MSWs, um, MFTs. Um, and I worked with the students and the supervisors for years on how to maintain a safe educational environment, which I believe is your role, am I correct? Okay, so here's, and what I did was, I have a whole training that usually is about 45 minutes long, but I'm gonna spare you the details that you don't need to hear, and I'm just gonna hit the major points that, um, that relate to you. So if I go too fast, just raise your hands, let me know, and um, I'll, try to make this as painless as possible because really nobody likes to I mean I'm learning that people really don't want to hear from me <laughs> so whenever I call someone I mean I really have to say it's not related to something inappropriate it, it's related it's really a question so I'm finding that you know just because I'm coming around it doesn't necessarily mean that I, that somebody did something wrong it's more for education prevention and support okay so who is a federally mandated employee all of you um, it really ha it's very similar to the law about, um, about mandated reporters, you know, like with uh, child welfare. And all of you are mandated reporters, right, as far as child welfare goes. And I also understand that you all have to inquire about domestic violence, correct? Um, and I only learned that when I had my second child, um, the, uh, the nurse who was getting me when I was in, in, uh, in labor, she asked my husband to leave the room and she asked me some really great, as a so clinical social worker, I'm like, yes, I'm glad you're asking me. So she had to, so she pointed to the wall at Kaiser and said, you know, are, do you need to report it? Basically asked me, do I need to report anything? And I said, no, I got a great husband, great marriage, we use our, our communication skills, we're good. So, but I was really happy to hear, you know, to see that they were asking. Um, so who's a mandated responsible, uh, responsible employee? All of you are. Um, and um, MREs, you have the obligation to report if anybody in your practicum sites, any students, or even if you're um, uh, like a supervisor, you know, with, if you're supervising a student, staff, faculty, you're obligated to report if somebody tells you that they are being discriminated against or if they've experienced um, a sexual assault or um, non-consensual sex. And how it relates to practicum, and this is what happened throughout the years as I was a field director, is that oftentimes our students um, are placed what we call, I don't know what you call them, we call them preceptors, but you have the supervisor and then you have the secondary supervisor. And a lot, sometimes, thank God, none of my supervisors had ever assaulted or discriminated against my students, but oftentimes there's other employees that they contract, the agency contracts with, or sometimes there's clients, or sometimes there's third parties who have discriminated against or verbally or sexually assaulted our students. And so when you get that news, then it is your job to report it to, to me 
as the, the Title IX coordinator, or go to your chair. Your chair, where I'm in the process of training all the chairs and deans. The deans are all trained. But I'm really at this place, I'm four months into this full-time position. So what I, my, my, one of my many <laughs> priorities is to, is to inform and train all of our chairs and deans about uh, Title IX and the reporting laws. Uh, you have somebody um, from the School of Nursing who's on my Title IX committee, and that's uh, Renee Posa. And so she's actually the one, she and I were meeting, and we act she's actually the one who, insta uh, who helped me facilitate this. So um, everybody has this mandate. Um, and I'll go, over, I'll go through the exceptions in a minute. So the Title IX um, federal mandate is that no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation or be denied the benefits or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So when the Supreme Court, when, when the law, this went into act in 1972, um, the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Justice, they really didn't tell us what to do. They didn't say, well, this is how you execute. They pretty much, every time a, a complaint came, they would, go, they would go to the law and then break it apart. Is there any, is this person experiencing discrimination and is the incident keeping them from receiving the full benefits of an education? So a lot of us think about Title IX with, um, Sports, how many of you think of sports, right? Yeah, athletics. Um, it actually started, um, this vice, oh, okay, it's a good story. A, uh, a woman um, in the 60s actually was applying for a PhD program, and she was told by a prestigious school that she, um, as a woman, she really shouldn't bother pursuing a PhD because she was a woman. And she said, oh yeah? And she actually found a law <laughs> I knew you would appreciate this because you're nurses and you're advocates. Um, she actually found a law having to do with admissions and employment. It was like an obscure uh, detail. And then she found a sympathetic attorney with the Office of Civil Rights and they ran with it. And she, she was one of the, she's probably the grandmother of this law. So um, not much has changed, but you know, this is, this is a good thing. So she actually pursued this and then it's just expanded. Uh, so this is what Title IX says we have to do. So what we do as institutions is we, we try, you know, we follow this law, and if the answer is they're not able to experience the full benefits, then we pursue the complaint. Um, definition, so we are not a court of law. So as a Title IX coordinator, I don't find somebody guilty or not guilty. So we don't use um, the legal terms such as rape and um, you know, the, the terms that are associated legally. So what we are pursuing is, if something happens on campus, and I'll break down uh, in a little bit about crimes versus harassment. Um, when something, when it, if, if a student or a staff or a supervisor tells you that they have been uh, harassed, or experience discrimination, we are concerned about the community member. So for example, somebody comes to you and at their, at their practicum, they say, um, I experienced uh, verbal um, sexual harassment. And the, offend the, the offender is not associated with our community we can't necessarily do an investigation with the offender, but what we can do is report it to HR of the agency or hospital where they're working. Um, and then our obligation is to take care of our community members. So then we will offer, my office will offer supportive resources for that individual. Um, then we're in communication, we meaning the Office of General Counsel and I are saying, okay, what can we do to ensure that this doesn't happen again at the, at the practicum? So I've been working with um, the, um, behavior and applied sciences and actually nursing with how can we, about developing a policy that will just kind of, something that we can all agree on and how do we vet agencies and people who uh, uh, educate and interact with our students. So we're in, those, in that process now. So I know that, I think what's nice is that being a professional program, there's, we have, you, you have a code of ethics, right? So a lot of this stuff is already taken care of, and that's actually my experience in social work as a because we have the NASW Code of Ethics. 
So we do what we can to already vet that, but I think we need to become more uniform so that we are ensured that we're in compliance with federal law. So these are the definitions that you will hear as a title, you know, in Title IX. Affirmative consent is that state law, yes means yes. That has to do with somebody. Um, that consent is given verbally, consciously, an adult, somebody over the age of 18, um, where every step of the way when sexual um, activity takes place, there is a verbal consent or there is an affirmative consent. Somebody who is passed out or too intoxicated or under the influence um, cannot give affirmative consent. And we're talking about adults. Um, the complainant, you, don't, you won't hear uh, the victim, accuser, accusee. You're gonna hear complainant and respondent. Those are the, that's the terminology. They're not legal terms, but it's what's being used in Title IX. Uh, domestic violence, dating violence, non-consensual sexual contact or intercourse is what we, so if that happens, say, between two students or two APU community members, we're going to determine whether or not a, a code of conduct or a violation has occurred. And the language that we're going to look, use is more likely than not responsible or more, more than likely responsible. And then we're going to cite the code of conduct or we're going to cite what violation has taken place. Um, if somebody wants to pursue legal action or make a police report, we don't discourage it. We say, you do what you need to do. You will have our support. If there's a police investigation, then we step back, let them do what they need to do, and then we continue with our own investigation. Um, other terms, um, sexual harassment, responsible employee, and this um, I'm sure you, you're familiar with. Uh, just a, some quick stats. This is just what we know. Um, it's current that we know that uh, basically the most vulnerable people um, when it comes to sexual assault are first year students, first and second year students. In the, between the months of September and November, um, the Department of Justice says most reports are uh, likely to occur on Fridays and Saturdays between 12 and 6 a.m. Uh, a lot, and the stats show us that um, a lot of these uh, uh, non-consensual sexual assaults are with people that, that they are acquainted with. Our institute's commitment is again just to encourage employees and students to report any concerns that have to do with sexual assault or discrimination. So anybody who you report to, um, it is always important that you let them know what the students has reported or what you've observed or what you've heard. Um, if, when in doubt, call me, uh, email me. I have a lot of faculty who call me and say, you know, Christine, I don't know if this constitutes a sexual assault or if this goes to Title IX, and I'll help you vet that out. So there's never a dumb question. I was just on the phone with faculty the other day talking about um, something that she, that she thinks is happening, so we kind of you know, waited out and said, all right, well, we decided whether or not it fell under Title IX. And then if it doesn't fall under Title IX, then I know where to send these cases. If it's over the weekend, like if it's on a Saturday morning and my office is closed, campus safety is open 24-7, um, their extension is 3998, three, and I've trained all of them, so they will know also what to look for and what to listen for, and then they'll relay the information to me. So the one thing that Campus Safety says is, when in doubt, just call, and then we'll help you um, determine what, what the next steps are. Um, a myth. I'm not going to go through all the myths, but the one that I hear the most is number four. Have you heard this? If I didn't say no, then I wasn't raped. So that is a myth, and I don't know how much detail I need to tell you, but we know that when we are traumatized, the body goes into shock, right? And it becomes an outer body experience, and it's the way God created us, and it's the way our brains protect us. And so I've had many survivors say, but I didn't say no. So my next question is, but did you say yes? So if the answer is, I don't know, then I need to investigate. Um, so that, and even when, as investigators, we're telling them, you know, it's like when you remember, do you remember the um, 80s, I think, when they had, with the Polaroid cameras? And so like when, we re when our brains recall trauma, it's like a snapshot, so it's not necessarily in order. So when students or when survivors are reporting incidences, it's going to be a little messy or maybe not, not very in chronological order. 
and that's perfectly normal. So, and I say that because a lot of times, and if anyone's worked with sexual assault survivors, you know that the first thing that they do is they second guess themselves. Or if somebody says something or looks at them or does something inappropriately and it's become a pervasive pattern and they're avoiding internship, they're getting anxiety, they're not wanting to go, but they're saying, no, it's just me, then our job is to say, no, it's not just you. If you're feeling this way, if you're experiencing, if you're changing your daily patterns, something is going on, something is wrong, and we need to trust our bodies and our minds and listen to that. So when you're talking to folks, you know, that's always important to to remember. And then, I, I won't go through all these, but that's the one that I wanted to highlight is that, because that is the most common, but believe it or not, all of, um, all of these still are very common uh, myths. The impact of underreporting is that the offenders are never held responsible, and I think that's the takeaway. Uh, so the more we educate and normalize the responses to sexual assault and discrimination, the, the more likely that person can get help. Uh, campus resources available to survivors, uh, they're confidential. So one of the things as, as, as mandated responsible employees, uh, do you all have your, your patients sign informed consent right at the beginning? It, like I know I, got, I had a, a crown put in, I had to you know, inform consent, then there's HIPAA and you know, all the other fun stuff. Um, so it's always important as you're, now you're out in clinical with the students, cor am, am I correct? So if, say, you're supervising or teaching, it's always, it's really important that, and this is actually what the Daryl Colleague letter says, the Title IX letter, it just say that we need to let our students know the nature of your relationship, that you are private but not confidential. And there's a big difference. So you're hired to be educators. Um, you're not hired by APU to be confidential. So when I was faculty, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm bound by confidentiality with my clients. Um, but not with my students. So if a student reported something to me that needed somebody, that needed intervention, I always let them know, I'm your educator, I'm your professor, I'm your field liaison, I am not your, your therapist. So it's important to make that distinction from the beginning so that, because it feels, you know, you don't want to betray, you don't want to ruin the relationship, and I hear that a lot, but if we step back and look at the big picture, we're, we're protecting the community, and it's not about us and our relationship with them, but it's only, but it's about keeping our community safe. And we all do not want to send a student into a hospital where we know that there's, you know, some kind of person, you know, uh, alleged professional who's, who's harassing our students. So we want to protect them at all costs. So that said, if they need to talk to somebody confidential, we have a counseling center, we have our campus pastors, um, or our chaplain, who's Kevin Manoia, uh, for graduate students, um, and we also have the APU Health Center. Those are confidential places. Uh, private would be the Women's Development Center, which is on East Campus, Campus Safety, Associate Dean of Students, and then um, our Student Affairs Office, um, uh, particularly Marla Love. She works, has a lot of experience and she, with Title IX and is on the Title IX Committee. So those are private sources, but not confidential. Okay, um, off-campus resources. Uh, I know you're not all around the Azusa area, but I, what I can do, if you don't already know the information, I kind of think you might, are, you know, use your local medical center. Um, we have Queen of the Valley, that's locally. This is the only hospital that does rape kits or perk kits for us. Um, Foothill does not. So the comment is, um, the School of Nursing will offer more resources on Sakai if you can get on it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this information. Okay. So those of you who are watching via DVD, this information will be available to you um, through the School of Nursing. How'd I do? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and then, so reporting again. I, I think I said this earlier. Just report if you if you. Uh, have a hunch that something's going on. You don't need to be detective, you just need to be the reporter. We'll figure out the hard stuff. Uh, policies to be aware of. So what if a student or somebody says, but I was drinking when it happened? We have in place what's called, some call it amnesty, we call it limited immunity. We are more concerned about the safety of the student than we are about whether or not they were drinking or under a controlled, um, controlled substance. So uh, the use of drugs does not make that person at, person at fault. Um, the other thing we do is that we want to 
we prohibit retaliation. So our safety's priority, if we need to move classes around, we will accommodate in a way that's fair both to, to the respondent and to the complainant. Um, interim measures, so during the investigation, so from the time we find out that there's a respondent and a complainant, the university has 60 days to carry out the, re the uh, adjudicating process. So in that time, there, these are services that we offer to the students um, in order to make sure that they, that they feel safe. We also have a no contact order if needed, so each party will get, from, from campus safety, they'll get a, a no contact order. Um, not to, con you know, whether it's physically, by phone, or through media, social media. Here's our process, just very quickly. Uh, we respond promptly. There's an intake process. There's folks on campus that are trained to complete intakes. We have um, trained at, um, investigators to go through the adjudicating process. We do have folks in grad programs. We do have somebody in nursing. And so basically, it's re we have investigators on each of the regional campuses, so we're really building our, our, our team. Um, the appeal process, so once, there's, once we've gone through the witnesses and the reporting part, or the respondent and complainant, we send out a letter of, a find, or a letter of findings and we let them know what the decision is, and it's always like 50 to, you know, 50 percent and a feather. And so, again, it's not a court of law, but we, based on what was reported to us, the decisions are made, it's sent to me, I approve it, or I make, you know, I have them make some, you know, do some tweaks, we send it to both parties, um, I let them know when it's coming, and then they have five days to appeal it. Um, e either party, they, they can appeal. Uh, quickly, another part that you need to know is about our Cleary Act. Do you know about Cleary? Okay, so Cleary, the only reason we bring this up, it used to be two different trainings and we said no more. So Cleary is, um, is our disclosure of campus security policy. That's the Crime and Statistics Act because every community member deserves to know whether or, not, or how safe or what the statistics are with crime. Cleary has to do with location. Cleary has to do with, um, it doesn't include sexual harassment, but it includes anything that'll basically get you in jail. So if there's, so do you, do you ever read the timely warnings? Or maybe you will. So we get timely warnings. So if something happens on property that is adjacent to APU, including our regional campuses, including the bakery in Glendora, anything that we have jurisdiction over would be reported under the Cleary Act. We put out, Campus Safety puts out a report once a year. We have to be as accurate as possible. If we're not accurate, we're fined severely. Um, so. We, you don't need to know this, but if you hear of a crime, you say, you know, I heard this, do I need to tell you? I'll say yes, thank you. And you don't need to decide whether or not it's Cleary or Title IX. Title IX location doesn't matter, so that's why I'm here talking to you. We, don't, we really aren't so concerned with the location, we're more concerned about our community member. And Title IX is about sexual harassment, domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, and sexual violence. So they overlap, but they are, there's a little bit of overlap, but they, you don't have to know all the details about Cleary other than if you hear about a crime, um, then we need, to, we, we need to know. This is our committee. Um, we are in the process of, develop, of creating a, an anonymous report, reporting system online. Uh, we're actually just going through the steps right now, so we're excited about that because we know it's, it's not always ever safe to report but sometimes if people do want to report something and they don't, they're afraid of the power differential, the ramifications, we, we're going to have this as a resource. And uh, we do have a website that I'm happy to say has been updated this past semester. Uh, so if you have questions, the, our policies and procedures are there. Um, the Title IX committee members are there. You'll see, you'll find my contact information and you'll find everything that you need to know about Title IX. And that's it.